Okay, so we are in phase seven of this series, Those Unworthy of Christ Will Perish. And today we're going to be looking at the parable of the talents. And, and you know, from there, I mean, we're going to be kind of analyzing it and, and cross-referencing with a bunch of other stuff. But... Um, it's I hopefully it'll be an interesting little uh journey through this this parable. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. So so we're all familiar with the parable of the talents. Um so I'll I'll just read through it somewhat quickly and then we'll start to analyze a little bit of the of the things that we can learn from it so it's in matthew 25 verse 24 through 30 and uh it comes right after the parable of the 10 virgin virgins it's isn't it matthew 14 through 30 matthew what parable what? of the talents parable of the talents is matthew through 30 not 24 through 30 Oh, I'm sorry. I, I started, yeah. The the ones I was looking at was uh, 24. But yeah, it does start at 14. Uh, Can change that. So, um, so it, it reads, For it is just like a man about to go on a journey who called his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents. We know that talents is just a bag of money. And it's not a small amount of money. Talent is, is a you know it's a good good size amount of money. Um, he gave five talents. Uh, to one he gave five talents to another two and to another one each according to his own ability, and he went on his journey. Now, this next word immediately uh, could be added to the to the end of this sentence, the the prior sentence. It, it could be he went on his journey immediately. There, some translations will, will prefer that. Some will say, we'll put the word immediately, the one who had received the five talents went and traded with them. Does it really make that much difference? People want to make a big deal out of it, but uh, to me, it's it's not that essential. Um, the one who received the five talents went and traded with them gain, and gained five more talents in the same manner. The one who had received the two talents gained two more. But he who received the one talent went away and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, after a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. The one who had received the five talents came up and brought five more talents saying, Master, you entrusted five talents to me. See, I have gained five more talents. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Also, the one who had received the two talents came up and said, master, you entrusted two talents to me. See, I have gained two more. Two more talents. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful slave. You are faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. By the way, have you figured out the surprise yet, Diane? No. Take a look at the screen. You got the hidden face behind you again? No. I mean, do you see my cursor? Oh, <laughs> wait a minute. No, I don't. You don't see my cursor? I do, but you ought to see my cursor. It's bigger than that? Much. Oh, that's crazy. All right. I I told him he needs to get a bigger cursor. So I can't, we can't see it. Oh. And he thinks it's, okay, I guess it's bigger, but. This is much bigger. Okay. Anyway, you and it's colored. 
Anyway. It's not so, color. It's lime. Oh. Okay. So on uh, starting with verse 24, and the one <laughs> also who had received the one talent came up and said, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. And I was afraid. And I went away and hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. But his master answered and said to him, you wicked, lazy slave. You knew that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have put my money in the bank. And on my arrival, I would have received my money back with interest. Therefore, take away the talent from him. Give it to the one who has the 10 talents. For to everyone who has, more shall be given. And he will have an abundance. But from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. Throw out the worthless slave into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Okay. So let's just get through some of the basics. What is the talent represent? Mysteries of the kingdom. Yeah, they they are the these are the knowledge of the mysteries. Of the kingdom. Yeah, understanding. Yeah, I mean, I, I got you. No, I got your treasures. Point. So th these are the things that are valuable to the master, and the things that are valuable to the master are things that are eternal. Yeah. Eternal truths, and um, the key the key truth that he was bringing, the new truth, were, was these mysteries of the kingdom of God. This this kingdom that he was bringing were, was not mentioned in the Old Testament, so there was no real explanation of this kind of interim period between the. Um, the old covenant kingdom and the millennial kingdom. Now, some people might have wondered about that, the clever ones, but there weren't really any clever ones at the time of Christ. But the clever ones might have thought they must have realized, like Isaiah, for instance, must have realized that the Messiah was going to need to die. So, if the Messiah was going to need to die, then what is happening with the millennial kingdom? How does that work? So some some people might have wondered what 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 what's happening between the death of Christ and the millennial kingdom? What's going on? So, <clears throat> but at the time of Christ, everyone thought the Messiah was not going to die. They had already misinterpreted all those passages. And so there was no real, uh, you know, that, that, that wasn't a question of the day. They, they all believed the Messiah was going to come and set up the millennial kingdom right away. Okay. Um, and, and that's, that's where it was, but the point of, of, of explaining this new kingdom that, that Jesus was bringing the spiritual kingdom, the ecclesia of God, was one of these treasures that Christ had, and and he was going to and he was basically giving this treasure to his slaves. Now, who are his slaves in this story? His slaves are everyone that called Jesus their master. They 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 basically identified as slaves of Christ. Did they act as slaves of Christ? Not all of them. Not all of them. But did they identify as slaves of Christ? Yes. Yes. So it's the the, the slaves in this story, you could say, are all those who identify as a follower of Christ saying that Jesus is their master. Now, those um, these are the same ones that identified as 
as as followers of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They, um, oh, not they're not all the same, by the way. And some identified as followers of the, of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but did not identify as a follower of Christ. Right? I mean, the Pharisees were one of them, and and all the Jewish establishment, all the teachers, they all were identified as followers of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but they did not identify as a followers of Christ. But I think in in the um, it, there's a similarity with the sheep and the goats that comes right after this parable where you have uh, the judgment and the separation of the sheep and the goats. What uh, Who are the sheep and the goats? Yeah. The, these are all all the people as a whole that identify as followers of God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay. They're not everyone in the globe. It's hmm. just those that identify as that. And, and among those, there, there are many that are imposters and hypocrites and they will be thrown out. That's basically the separation of the sheep and the goats. Hmm. And, and, and that's, and that comes I think almost right after this parable here. So just, just to be clear, there are many people today that identify as slaves of Christ. But how many of those that identify as slaves of Christ act and behave as slaves of Christ? Hmm. That's the question. Very few. Well, yeah. Uh, very, very few. Because most don't even understand anything about Christ. Um, so those designated are people, uh, and so I, I kind of like in verse 32 is, is the, uh, those designated peoples of the nations uh, gathered before Christ are those who are, are who call the, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, their God. Okay. That can't be 32. That's got to be wrong. It is. That's the judgment. Oh, I'm in the wrong. Uh, I have to get to Matthew 25. I, what verse is it? It's, it's it can't be 32, unless uh, I don't know. Well, 32 is on the judgment. I thought it was 14 to 30. No, no, no. Is it what? He will put sheep on his right. What verse? Looks on the left. 31 to 46. I have to get the judgment. The judgment is 32. Yeah. I, I don't know why I said it. All, hmm. Yeah, I see your point. What about verse 33? Those who call it. Compare with 31 through 46. Hmm. Oh. Oh, I see what I said. I see what I did. I see what I did. So, okay. So I'm comparing this the slaves here as anyone that identifies as Jesus as the master with the sheep and the goats in 25, 31 to 46. That all the 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 peoples of the nation gathered before Christ are all those who identify as a follower of God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's what I was doing. <clears throat> but the slaves of Christ identified, you know, are, are basically categorized as that. So there's going to be a lot of imposters. There's going to be a lot of hypocrites. But the brothers of Christ are just are defined to be those who do the will of the Father. Hmm. So you could be a slave of Christ and a brother of Christ, but more likely you you call yourself a slave of Christ and you're a hypocrite. That that's the the vast majority, because if you know, you don't even have to be part of the kingdom, really, to be identified as a slave of Christ. Um, but anyway, I'm, I'm kind of getting technical. But that that's, I, I wanted to get that out there because it's important to understand that in many of the parables where they separate the fish in the, in the parable of the dragnet, in, in the parable of the ten virgins, uh, right before this parable, another separation of 
those that have their lamps lit and those that don't. And that that happens a lot and it goes on and on and on. It's probably the biggest theme of his parables is the separation. And that's why when he says he comes there to separate and he's got this winnowing, winnowing fork to separate mm. the wheat from the chaff, it's a it's a real deal. And, and that's what the Ecclesia of God is all about, is trying to separate the the phonies from the real, real McCoy, you know, the, the authentic. And, and Mark, yeah. In the, in the church system, when they read this parable, they're thinking of the goats as everybody that is not a Christian. They're the pagans, everybody yeah. in the whole world. They, they don't see it as followers of Christ or, or am I right. making right and 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 you know I mean look at the context you have the parable of the ten virgins these are people that clearly are waiting for the bridegroom okay these are these all ten are waiting for the bridegroom five of them don't make it right because they're hypocrites they're phonies Jesus says I don't know you even though they're waiting for the bridegroom. And and they didn't leave. They stayed. And and they they stayed so long that they they fell asleep. They stayed the entire time. They didn't leave. They weren't ready. But they um didn't have any extra oil. I mean I could I could go into why that you know why that's true, but basically their lamps were not lit and they knew their lamps needed to be lit. They couldn't just tag along with the other five that had lit lamps. They knew they had to have a lamp that was lit. They knew that. That's why they asked to borrow oil. We said, no, we can't do that. Go get it from a dealer. And of course, they go, I mean, what, what choice do they have at this point? So they go and, and find, try to find a dealer. But in, in any event, that's a separation. That's a separation from the authentic. And, and the phonies and the hypocrites, that's a separation. The parable of the talents, it's a separation from the phonies and the hypocrites, okay? The judgment, sheep and goats, goats look like sheep. It's a separation from the phonies and the authentic. It's just, it's all in the same, mm -hmm. same uh, genre. It, it's all the same theme. And it, even if you went back to 24, and and you go, uh, they, they talk about the sensible slave his master puts in charge of his household. Blessed is that slave who, who's doing the right thing when he comes. But what about the slave that doesn't? And the evil slave says in his heart, my master's not coming for a long time, begins to beat his fellow slaves and eat and drink with drunkards. Meaning they were getting drunk on the world's pleasures. They, they were getting drunk uh, having fun in the here and now. The master of that slave will come on, on a day when he does not know it and, and will cut him into pieces. Okay. So, um, and, and he will sign a place with the, and, and will, and will assign him a place with the hypocrites in that place to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So the whole, the whole theme, of of Matthew uh, twenty four and twenty five. I mean, we could go in on oh, up here and and do all this kind of stuff. But the whole theme is a separation of those that think they're Christians, think that they're followers of God, and they're not. They yeah they they have every intention to get in. Oh, they, they think, think they they, they they completely believe they're get, they're getting in. So these can't be non believers. No. Because non-believers have no interest in them. no, yeah, no. They're not looking. They're not waiting for the bridegroom. Yeah, there's no way this is non-believer. <clears throat> they're not calling Jesus Master. Yeah, they're not doing any of that. Yeah, I mean, even down here in the judgment, um, they call him Lord, Lord. Yeah. When did we see you hungry? Yeah, and not take care of you. Yeah. See, so a non a non-believer is not going to call him Lord. Yeah. Hmm. So. These are the things that are just really kind of obvious on its face. But yet, how does the church get it wrong? How do they do it? 
You know, how do they get it so wrong? It's because they want to get it wrong. I, I really don't believe they're that dumb. It's all about separation. Jesus came to separate the wheat from the chaff. He came to bring fire. He came to separate, uh, you know, mother and daughter, uh, mother-in-law from daughter-in-law, father-in-law from from son-in-law. Oh, he went, he goes through a whole list of who he's going to separate, family members. Oh. It's all about separation. Because <clears throat> the 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 pagans and the the heathens and <clears throat> and the ones that hate God and all that they're they're a non-issue. We all know where they're going. It, it's a non-issue. Hmm. It's it you, you don't need discernment to figure that one out, right? The ones that are an issue, and the one he would warn about over and over at least fourteen times, but probably more often. Always about separation, the authentic from the hypocrites. The authentic from the hypocrites, constantly. And Mark, the the bottom line is that they they call themselves Christians, but they really didn't do the will of God. They don't do the will of God. They don't even know the will of God. They don't even seek the will of God. They don't, yeah. they don't read their scripture. They sit around and enjoy the world and have this this weird idea that they're headed towards heaven. Yeah, How do they get that idea? Yeah. I don't know. Mostly through the church gospel. A lot of it's through the church programming uh, and the people around them will, will, will confirm that that's the way it works and everyone's nodding their head, but yeah. no one's looking, no one's reading, no one's studying. You know, that it's it's shocking, but there it is. Mark, if I had a if you went to a, a Sunday school class and you were talking about these parables, everyone would think you they were talking again about the pagans, the absolute non-believers. Yep. And they'd all be wrong. And and they're clearly wrong. I mean, it's not even a you know, it's not even a close call. It's just obviously wrong. The reason why they believe that is that they don't, first of all, they don't read it themselves. And if they do read it themselves, all they do is just take the interpretation of stuff that's been told to them and regurgitate it and try to jam it in when it doesn't fit. It's forced into their framework, <clears throat> which is faulty. It's just, it's, it's just too easy. If I had, if I had to, argue a case and and there were there were people that pushing the church system dogma in front of a judge and and I I would blow them away the plain language you always look at the plain language of the statute first so all I have to do is look at the plain language your honor I don't understand what he's talking about he's just making that up it's not in the language at all and the judge would have to agree. And that case would be, you know, I, I would easily win that case. So <clears throat> this is what I'm saying. It, this is too easy. And, and and a lot of these things are too easy. And they're just too obvious to, to pass up. What? Then what in the world? Why are people doing it? Because they don't want to know the truth. They want to be their ears to be tickled. They want to have that comfortable feeling that they're on their way to, to, to the pearly gates. They want to feel like they're with all their friends, their church buddies. They, they just want to feel like they belong and we're all partying on our way to, to, to heaven. And isn't this great? And they give a lot of lip service to God. We're, we're going to talk about that. <clears throat> but um, I want to move on. Pe people that have ears to hear will see this. They will see this easily. People that don't, that resist, and there's plenty of them, they won't. They'll blind themselves. So, <clears throat> masters, the master's money entrusted to servants represents the valuables of the master entrusted to his disciples. The valuables of Christ are the teachings of Christ that will never pass away. Eternal truths leading to eternal life. As demonstrated 
in the life he led. Uh, so this is important. This is why we are to eat him as the bread of life. Just as he prepared his whole life to present himself as a living sacrifice for his bride, even unto death. See, he sacrificed his life for his bride in the fact that he lived a life that was an example to the bride. <clears throat> Most of his life was a showcase. That's why he was the light of the cosmos. Um, so, and I, I have, a, a, okay. So he, he presented himself as a living sacrifice for his bride, even unto death. We are to prepare our whole lives and in, in, in our lives should be in preparation to present ourselves as a living sacrifice for his bride. That is the ecclesia of God. <clears throat> and, and it's called the ecclesia. We already looked at this, 2 Corinthians 11, 2. Talks about the bride. I, I, I betrothed you to Christ. I wanted to present you as a chaste virgin. Okay. So that's in 2 Corinthians 11, 2. Even unto death. Even if I have to die which many people did. Now, Matthew 16, uh, again, you should, you should be looking at this like almost every day. I mean, you just, just bury this in your head because this is, this is really one of the essence of the Christian life. Jesus says, if anyone wishes to come after me, and meaning that you want to follow him to, to heaven, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me in my life. Follow what I, follow my passions, follow my objectives, follow my values, follow my priorities. Follow my devotion to the Father. Follow my commitment. Um, and just follow the fact that I lost my life. I do nothing on my own initiative. Follow that. That's what you need to follow. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. If you're trying to hang on to your life in the world, you're trying to be all you can be. You want you have little personal goals. You have personal goals and you want to pursue them. You'll lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, and then some say for my sake in the Gospels, will save it. And uh, that's in Mark. But it says, whoever loses his, his life for my sake will find it. And what will he find? What are you losing your life for? You're Eternity. losing your life to live the life of Christ. That's what you will find. Yeah. Because you're losing your life for his sake. And what will you find? What life will you find to live? Because if you lose your life, well, now how do you live? You live as Christ. You live the life of Christ. Christ That's, lives in me, as Paul said. Exactly. Christ lives in me. It's not I who live, but oh, Christ who yep, lives, in me. lives in me. That's the life you find. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Okay. So this is just, he's just trying to be logical here and just say, I have no idea why anyone would want to, you know, be all you can be. And, and what if you did, what if you did achieve everything you wanted to achieve? He's basically <laughs> saying, what if everything, all your, all your dreams are fulfilled? Everything that you tried to go for, you were the best, you were the king, you were the, you were awesome. You got the whole world. You still die. But you still die and you still forfeit your soul. What profit yeah. does now what do you have? Nothing. It all goes to zero. That's what he's saying. Your yeah, Solomon wrote about that. Is zero. Yeah. So that's right. that's all he's saying. It's it's a very simple question. But you know, so many people just I don't know, they just blow by it. They just don't get it. And, and what will you give in exchange for your soul? I mean, is it worth living 40 years at the top of your game 
fulfilling all of your of your goals and fulfilling all your dreams, the life of your dreams, is it worth 40 years of that? If you get 40 years, but it, let's just say you do get 40 years of that. You're living 40 years of that. Is that worth your soul? Is that the, is, would you exchange your soul for that? Some people would. Some people would. They sell their souls to the devil. Yep. For the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels and then will repay every man according to his deeds. Your deeds will judge you. You'll be judged by your deeds. And that's the robe that you'll be wearing, right? Yeah. And 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 they will be very, very dirty for most people. The robes will be filthy. Right. And and nope. and, no and you will get repaid. You will get repaid. You will get what's coming to you. That'll never pay you up for dirty. And I, I don't know, is that something I'm supposed to hear? Or <laughs> could, no. I could... uh, Darlene made a comment about me and my robe. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. Gotta wear a dirty robe. Laundry day. <laughs> don't wear that robe. <laughs> <laughs> no. But Sorry. everyone Sorry. will get repaid. So no one's getting away with anything. You're going to get what's coming to you, every single person in this life. So uh, you lose your life to live the life of Christ. Put another way, Jesus is the new covenant law personified. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Yeah, I like that. Jesus is the new covenant law personified. So in all that he did, all that he said, all that he taught, his example. That's your job. Yeah. Is to do that. And of course, you're going to have to lose your life to do that. You have to lose your life to find it. You have to lose it. There, there's no other way. You can't do both. You can't live a life of Christ and live your own life at the same time. You can't live a double life. They People will try. They think they're they're pulling it off, but they're not pulling it off. They're losing. But they will convince themselves that they're fine. They will gaslight themselves all day long. Scriptures are full of examples of people gaslighting themselves, believing they're going to heaven. The bridesmaids, as they're sitting there with their lamps, thinking they're on their way to meet the bridegroom. They're going to the wedding feast. There's no way. I mean, they, they, they were shocked. When the door was shut on them, shocked. Couldn't believe it. Couldn't believe it. And then when he said, I don't know you? Are you kidding me? I've been cheering for you my whole life. I've been your biggest fan. But see, th this is what's coming. This is definitely coming. It's going to happen to millions. Millions of people. This is exactly what's going to happen. And those people that don't wake up and smell the coffee and don't read their scriptures and don't realize where they're headed, uh, they're going to get, you know, blown away. So that is what, that is all of that, what I just said, is part of the understanding that was given in different degrees. Now, the really the only thing you really need, if you were if you were if you were diligent, the only understanding that you really need to start with is that Jesus is the Son of God. If you start with that, then you're going to want to learn everything about Him. You're going to want to hang on every word He says. You're going to want to understand every single teaching he had. If you believe that he's the son of God and his words are the words of the father and he is the light of the cosmos, 
you are going to want to dig in and memorize every word he has said and understand it. That would be your life passion, right? You should. If, if you were a true worshiper of the Father, that's all you would need to know. And you would be on it. Okay. But what do people do? They say Jesus is the Son of God, and that's about all they know. They know nothing else. So it's just, it's, it's, it's a huge disconnect. So he's giving these abilities, or I'm sorry, he's giving these talents in, at different portions according to their ability, to each the ability, each slave. Now, is there something about that? Well, what is the ability that would that would um, okay? How do you put? I mean, what what do you think that ability is? What on what basis is he giving different amounts of his treasure? Their ability to understand it, their ability to communicate it, their abil ability to grasp the the depth at what depth they can grasp and understand. And so, what and how does how does Jesus put that succinctly? That that to, all that to, what you're saying to whoever is given much more will be required. That that teaching. Yeah. I mean, what, how would you, how would you, I mean, to what, what do you think would, would determine the amount of understanding that someone would get, that he would give someone? Well, each, it says each, uh, talking about the gifts of the spirit, each is given. According, it says, according to your own measure, it will be measured to you. According to yeah. your own measure, right? Right. According to your own measure, it will be measured to you. He says that, right? Right. Right. What the, what is the, the measure of what they're willing to sacrifice their life? Well, that okay, that's certainly that's certainly a factor. Pay the cost. Pay the cost. That's certainly a factor. You know, that's John, a but let, let me let me put, let me let me say this: everyone that even gets in will pay the cost. I mean, as far as make that sacrifice because. That sacrifice is nothing so, new. But the one talent guy didn't. No, no, because he didn't get in. I'm saying everyone that gets in, on... everyone that gets in the kingdom will, will the, the minimum they, that will be required is that they lose their life, they pick up their cross and follow Christ. That's the minimum. Yeah. You're not getting in. No, you're not even getting close. If you don't do that, because you're 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 a hypocrite. If you don't do that, you're a phony. You're not a real slave. You're not authentic. But but there's there's okay. Let me just say, the one thing that he tells you, and he and he and he and he says it in this in this parable, if what if something that you have that will produce more, the thing that you have that will produce more is eyes to see and ears to hear. If you have eyes to see and ears to hear, okay, you will receive more, what? More secrets, more mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, and you will have an abundance. But if you don't have eyes to see and ears to hear, even what, what you have, even the understanding you might have that was given to you, you will lose it. It will be taken away. So yeah. the, the character quality that you have that produces more, that will produce more mysteries, more understanding, is eyes to see and ears to hear. But those are given. What is? Given to you, eyes to see and ears to hear. Yeah. Everyone gets a certain a degree of faith, so to speak. And that's the ability. Right. Like yeah. We're talking about you okay. can see things easier. But 
Um, that's because there are different roles in heaven, and those right. roles have to be filled. Right. And everyone's going to have a different role. As there's different roles in an ecclesia, as there are different right. body parts. Right. Everyone functions. has a different role. But all necessary. And, but everyone in every role is going to have to lose their life. There's, there's no question about that. That's a minimum. Every single person. If anyone can't pick up their cross and follow him, he's out. He's not worthy. Yeah. If everyone, if anyone cannot lose their life to find it, he's out. Not worthy. Okay. These are people, these are those that are not worthy. Claim to be disciples of Christ, claim to, to believe in Christ, but they're not worthy. Mark. But, okay. Yeah. Well, same with uh, John 8 31. That's that's a requirement. If you continue in my word, you're you if you continue in my word, you're truly my di disciples and you know the truth. Right. That's 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 one of it. And you, and you didn't finish it. Free. <laughs> and the truth will set you free. Correct. Yeah. Correct. So and it's you not only be... it's not only pick up your cross and follow me, then you have to do this, th these other things. If you keep my commandments. That's but another. that's following him is keeping his commandments. Right. You know, if if you're keeping his commandments, what are you doing? You're imitating his life. That's what you're doing when you keep his commandments. So um so that so I I it, it, this is what I wrote. The ostensible purpose of entrusting the master's valuables was so that the servants would multiply the valuables for the benefit of the master. Right? I mean, that that seems, I mean, that's definitely a requirement. You have to multiply the benefit. You have to multiply the values for the benefit of the master. So everyone has to have some eyes to see and some ears to hear. You have to have that. There is a minimum level. But some will produce fruits of 30. Some will produce fruits of 100. They'll have different depending upon how many eyes, how many, you know, how good their eyes are and how, how good their ears are. But you got to have, you got to have some, you have to have a minimum requirement. Okay. So but, producing fruits, uh, would that be also, if I'm giving this talent, then I have to share that and disciple others. Well, yeah, that's going to happen. That's going to happen, but the, the, the problem is that we immediately want to do that before we know what we're talking about. <laughs> that that's the problem. Well, that's yeah. what we're that's what we're taught. Yeah, yeah, I, I know, and and we we want to be careful that um, we that we make these uh, we make these commitments ourselves. So that we we can kind of come from a place where we know how it works, right? You, you kind of have to go down wow. the narrow road a few times. Become a, like someone said before you make a disciple, you got to be a disciple. Yeah, and and to be a disciple means that you have to lose your life. It means that you have to pick up your cross and follow him. You you have to you have to get past that threshold. Okay, that means you can't rely on the worldly things. You're not worried about insurance and jobs and, and, and assets and retirement. You're not worried about that because you're focused on staying in the will of God and he is your rock. He's your refuge. And, and, and you know that, that he is your father and he doesn't let his children starve. He's a father. He's a good father. He's not going to give you stone if you're asking for bread. It, it, and when you believe that he's your father and he's going to take care of you, then you're then you're released. You're free from all of the worldly entrapments that try to enslave you. But there's only a few, there's only very few people that are true children of God. The rest are on their own. They have to worry about worldly provisions. Because they don't really have God as their father. I mean, have you ever wondered the reason why people have a hard time with trusting God for provisions is because they deep down inside they realize they're not really a child of God. 
God really isn't their father. Hmm. So anyway, but this is the ostensible thing that you're going to multiply the valuables for the benefit of the master, which is true. It is true. The, the wicked slave had that right. That's what the wicked slave said. But he's tr he's right about that. But however, the master doesn't need to get richer. You see, this is what you need to know, understand about the master. He's rich enough. He yeah. doesn't need more money. So what's he doing? What's 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 the actual purpose? The actual purpose is to train the servants how to be productive, and thus more to be more useful to the master. Hmm. The servant benefits by by becoming wiser and achieving a higher rank. The master hmm. benefits by receiving back a more useful servant. But if you don't return anything. If you don't produce anything, you're not of any use. You you're, know, not you're not a you're useful... You're not participating in the training. You can't... They can't use you yeah. in the kingdom. In the kingdom, there's only places for useful servants. Servants that are not useful are discarded. Mm. There's no place for them. So that's why he calls the 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 slave worthless because there's no use for you. I can't use you. The kingdom only allows servants that can be used. They're useful. They have a useful place. If you can't be useful, you can't come in. It's a very elite kingdom in that respect. It only allow it only accepts servants that are useful. So, um, then I talk about the be benefit. I mean, what is the ability that produces more understanding, wisdom, eyes to see, ears to hear, and in Matthew twenty five, for you know, the, it, it repeats that that phrase we talked about before. For to everyone who has eyes to see and ears oh, to hear, yeah. more mysteries of the kingdom of God shall be given. And you will have an abundance, but from the one that does not have eyes to see and ears to hear, even the understanding of mysteries he does have will be taken away. And and you can you can we've gone through the the exercise already, but you can go to Matthew 13, 10 through 17, and, and see how that plays out, how it how that proves itself. Now, he calls the good servants good and faithful. So they're good because they have eyes to see and ears to hear. They love the master. They're eager to work hard for the master. You see, when you love the master, you want to please the master. It's not a chore. It's not. It's not something that you you know you have to do that, you, that a box you have to check. You're eager to find time to please the master. You're eager to find time to work for the master. You're eager to get in the game. You want to be in the game because you want to please the master. You want to, you, you, cause you love him. That's what you do for people you love. You know, we have lots of examples of that in, in just ordinary life, things that you love, you do things for them and you enjoy doing things for them. Okay. And it's not that it's not work. It's just, it doesn't drain you. It doesn't drain your energy. It it gives you energy to work for the master. Um, so this is why the evil, uh, the evil slave saw it as, oh, he, he's exploiting us. He's using us. Well, the, the good, the good slaves saw it as, oh, awesome. I get an opportunity to prove myself to the master. I get to, I get to please him. I get to do something for him. Something that he will actually appreciate. You know, when you're trying to find something that you're that the one you love will appreciate, and and it's very frustrating when when you when they don't. But you can do something for the master that he appreciates, that he actually says, "Well done," and that's going to make you feel good because you love the master. 
So the so the so in a sense, the master is looking for the fruit and also the growth of the individual that he's given the opportunity to. It's yeah, it's mainly for for the growth. He's, ple he's pleased with the slave, and he's pleased with the with the with the fruit as well. Yeah, of course. He's not just looking for the fruit, like you said, but it's but it's the it's the growth of the of the slave yeah the useful the youth the usefulness of the slave um is pleasing to the master yes of course okay okay he wants to see you thrive yeah he wants to see you do well mark yeah uh i don't know if this is a farewell comment or verse in ephesians 6 where, where uh, paul is talking to the ephesians uh he goes in here six, five slaves be obedient to those who are your master, according to the flesh, with fear and trembling in the sincerity of your heart as to Christ, not by way of eye servants as men pleasers, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will, render service as to the Lord and not to men. Yeah, isn't that? I mean, everything we do as a slave to Christ, we do it with, I may not like it, but I'm doing it because the love of Christ and I'm his, I'm his slave and I do it out of that attitude. Yeah. So in that, in that passage, these people were, they found themselves as slaves and they had a master, an earthly master. Right. And so they're serving their earthly master. Um, because they are slaves of Christ, right? And so be because they're slaves of Christ, they're going to serve their earthly master uh, in, with sincerity. With good, with good service. Yeah, and, and they're, not, they're not just going to be serving the earthly master when he's looking, but he's oh. gonna be, they're going to be serving the earthly master even when he's not looking because they're, they're a slave of Christ who's always looking. And, right. and and they're really providing service to their er earthly master as a service to their their master their heavenly master Christ you see what I'm saying that's that's what that's what he's saying in that passage that when you provide good service to your earthly master you're actually providing service to your heavenly master so provide good service to your earthly master because that pleases your heavenly master that's what he's saying in that passage you look confused no i'm I, that, that this verse had a big impact on my own life years ago yeah it is that wait a minute i'm in a situation what am i going to do uh so and that verse really spoke to me i'm doing whatever i'm service i'm doing i'm doing it's the lord yeah for his glory for his praise and 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 not for not for mine, right? And it changes your whole attitude, no matter what situation you're in. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Good. I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, you know, it's it's always, you know, a question of how do you serve your heavenly master? You know, yeah. what what is it that you are to do to serve your heavenly master? Um, now that was in Ephesians, right? You, you read that yeah. from Ephesians? Yeah. So this slave was part of an ecclesia and this slave, um, had, you know, was, was having to, in their earthly situation, had to serve an earthly master. So all of this, this idea of, how do you please your heavenly master? Many times you're in a situation where pleasing your earthly, you know, your earthly employer at times um, pleases your heavenly master. But but it's it's kind of tricky in, in, in certain cases. When you're a slave, 
you know, for, for whatever reason, he basically said, I, I don't want to get into this too much because it's going to take too much time, but he tells you, don't even try to change your situation. He says that in first Corinthians, don't, don't try to change your situation. If, if you are a slave, if you can be free, be free. Do you, don't get me wrong. If you, if you can free yourself, do that, but don't, don't, uh, don't go nuts trying to free yourself when it's not available to you is what he's saying in first Corinthians, because I think if it is possible to free yourself, you should. Why? Because it gives you more time to serve your heavenly master in another capacity, huh. maybe in a more effective capacity. But anyway, that, that's a different discussion, but um, let's go to uh, a few things where he says you've been faithful in a few things. So it, it sounds like he's trivializing <laughs> what, what, the, what the servants did. You know, it's like you were faithful in a few things. And, and now I'm going to be now I'm going to make you responsible for much, for much greater things. OK, and we have to understand that this is on Earth. It's like a boot camp. It's like a training ground. You mm -hmm. are being trained. There are certain things thresholds that you must achieve one of the thresholds you must achieve is you have to lose your life to find it you have you have to want to live the life of christ okay that's and and pick up your cross because it may be humiliating and you might die whatever you're going to pick up your cross and follow him follow his life those are things that are that are absolute minimum those are things that you will never make it to the kingdom if you don't achieve that threshold, that that milestone. So when you when you have that, when when you achieve that, when you get to that point where you're able to be free from the world and the world entrapments, because you trust you trust God as your father, and you can serve him with freedom, okay? then what you are given to do or given to, to increase and multiply are considered just a few things. They're, they're kind of just, they're like a little test. Let's see what you can do. Let's see how you can multiply these little few things that I'm giving you. Okay. And, and so th there's, we, we tend to inflate the difficulty of the sacrifice required to serve Christ in a good and faithful manner. Losing your life and picking up your cross at our level in, in this earthly you know, context is light work for someone having a heavenly perspective and someone that loves his master. It's not a big chore to lose your life. It's not a big you know, deal to pick up your cross to someone that has a heavenly perspective. Because you've already understand the world is nothing. And all the pleasures of the world and all the achievements of the world go to zero. You already get that. So um, if, if you're someone that has that heavenly perspective, you're not going to find it that weird and difficult and, and, and gut-wrenching to do to losing your life. It's because this life isn't worth anything. And you've already realized that. And, and, the, and to you, that's kind of like one Oh one. So that part of it is just, is just something that we tend to amplify uh, because it seems like such a sacrifice, but actually when you think about what you're giving up, you're not giving up anything. You're giving up trash. It's all temporary. So, but if you don't have that heavenly perspective, you think you're giving up a lot. So it, it all depends on your perspective. It all depends on how you see things. And it all depends on whether you really believe in the hereafter. And you really believe in a judgment day. And you really believe in a heaven and a hell. And you really believe that all of this is real and true. And it's going to happen. And, and you believe that the earth is going to burn and the world's going to burn and you're going to die. And, you know, <laughs> all, 
all the question. things that we talk about. So, Mark. That, yeah. So all the attributes that you just talked about, dying to self, everything. Can I be a great athlete or an artist? And have those that those talents and still die to Christ and that and have that in the right perspective. That that's my life, that's my commitment. That's uh, the most important thing. Even though I can, you know, pull vault 25 feet or I I the greatest artist that it was ever you know, on earth. Yeah, I mean, to you being the greatest artist on earth is really it's trash. It's trash. That's how you see it. it with a in a heavenly if you have a heavenly perspective. Yeah, if I have a heavenly, it's just it's just something I can do, but it has no meaning because it all ends anyway. Yeah, it doesn't. Yeah, because it all goes to zero when. When you're dead, so you you when when you see that you understand that and that and that's like that's buried in your brain. That's like you're basically saying, yeah, no duh. Yeah, you're not going to think going being a great artist is a big deal. No, well, it's like, and the reason I bring that up, there's a couple of in this Olympics, a couple of athletes, one in particular, I can't remember which one it was that just is talking about Christ dedicating his life, all the kind of things we've been talking about. And yet here he is, this athlete, but it seemed like he was saying, this is nothing. That, 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 that his achievement was, yeah, it wasn't nothing in the big scheme of things compared to his walk with Christ. Well, it isn't. Yeah. He's right about that, but the, but then why do you spend his life doing yeah. it? Well, That's easy to say. <laughs> I know, I know. You know, it's like, why do you go to work and, and uh, yeah. Yeah. why does somebody make you a manager? What are, you know, why should I, you know, I'm running a crew. Why should I, I do? So. Why don't well, I here's do what that? I'm saying. Here's what I'm saying to you. And we're going to get to this, but it's not like you don't have anything else to do. You Thank see, you. when he gives, when he gives you these, um, uh, you know, his property, when he gives you this understanding you have a lot to do to to uh, increase this understanding, you see. And 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 it, the, the church system doesn't understand that. The church system, the dogma doesn't get that. Okay, we, we have to go on a little further. Go ahead, Steve. Okay, so this heavenly perspective is crucial. Yeah. It's very crucial. How yeah. then do how then do we develop it? How then do we have that perspective grow in our lives if we're picking up our cross? Read your scripture. Them? If you're doing what, Good. Steve? Thank you. Yeah. Because, I mean, we, because we want this perspective to grow to a point that losing a life, picking up a cross is light work because of your love for the master. You, you want to see that clearly. Yeah. Where so many people don't, and I'm just beginning to see it. That's your priority. Yeah, you, you have to read your scripture to get a heavenly perspective. Would you say the more that we know Christ, the more that we're abiding in him? Okay, those are that those are big words. I mean, well, you, yeah, you have to know what that means. Well, that so let, let let's just go, let's go. Let's go a little further, okay? Because there's a lot more to, to talk about. <laughs> this this kind of service, this this light work that I'm just talking about, this kind of service is just another Tuesday for an authentic man of God. This is not a big deal. I mean, people act, talk about it like it's a big deal. It's really not. It, it's what every man of God did, uh, you know, since the dawn of time. If you're a man of God, you, you basically, uh, you you gave up your life. To, to seek God. That was your life. Your life was seeking God. That was your life. That's the life you chose. Um, if you go to Deuteronomy 30, okay, if you go to Deuteronomy 30, we know what Deuteronomy 30 is, the restoration of Israel, right? Yeah. That's a picture of what it looks like for someone involved in the new covenant, under the new covenant. It gives you a picture 
And, and the picture is, and you return, he says, and you return to the Lord your God and obey him with all your heart and soul. Yeah. According to all that I command you today, you and your sons, then the Lord will, your God will restore you from captivity and have compassion on you, will gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord, where, where the Lord your God has scattered you because he scattered them because of the curses. Now, notice though, what is the beginning of the restoration? The beginning of the restoration is returning to the Lord and obeying him Amen. with all Amen. your heart and soul. That's the beginning of the restoration. Yeah. It's obeying him with everything you got. You're trying to obey him with everything you got. That's the beginning of the restoration. Okay. And then it goes on and talks about, you know, some other things. And then it says, moreover, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God, whoops, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul so that you may live. So the beginning is obeying with all your heart and soul, meaning you have to know the commands. You have to understand how to obey the commands and pursue obedience with everything you have. You're not going to, first of all, you're not going to have time for a whole lot of hobbies and, and passions, other passion, worldly passions and worldly objectives when you're doing that. You're just not going to have the time. You know, you're just not going to have the time. Jesus was not an athlete. He, he might, might, maybe if he had gone in that direction, he could have been an athlete. Or I don't know any man of God that was recognized as an athlete, a great athlete that's, that's crowned and all that kind of stuff. Because that's usually not the direction that God wants him to go. Okay, but obeying him with all your heart and soul is going to take a lot of time. You have to figure it out and you have to understand it. You have to take it seriously. You got to roll up your sleeves. That's not, it's, it's, that's not easy. And then once you do that, then he'll circumcise your heart and, and the heart of your descent and love it so that you will love the Lord. You'll cut away the flesh from your heart, cut away all the flesh so that it's just your heart, a, a heart of flesh is, is left. I mean, not, it's, it's, it's all the stone is gone. All, all, the, all the things that, 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 that distract you and entice you, all those things are dead to you now. And then you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, so that you may live. You need to love, the God, lo you need to love God with all your heart and soul so that you can live, which means everything else in comparison, you hate, including your own life. That's what Jesus says, makes it clear to us. Loving the Lord with all your heart and soul is, is a very, it's, it's something you have to go. You have to get there. And that means that everything else becomes trash to you. That's the goal. That's the objective. And that only begins when you obey him with all your heart and soul. Then you you get your heart circumcised, and so you love God with your heart and soul, and that's what you that's where you have to get to so that you can live. If you don't get there, you don't live. So this is this is similar to what he's saying. He's saying, "Abide in me, and I in you." Abide in my words, he's saying. Abide in my teachings. Abide in, in, in understanding who I am. And, and I will live in you. You will take on my life. You will lose your life to live my life. That's what it means with I in you. you. That he will live through you. You will take on his life. And that's, that's how you bear fruit. As a branch cannot bear fruit unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, you're living the life of Christ. He bears much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you're not living my life, you can do nothing. If you don't lose your life to find mine, 
you can do nothing. That's what he's saying there. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up. And they gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. That's what happens to those who don't abide in him. You have to abide in him. You have to know him. You have to study him. You have to understand him. You have to be immersed in Christ, which means you're going to have to read scripture every day. You have to immerse yourself in the commands of Christ and you have to love it. Or you're thrown away and you're burned up. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Uh, the Father gave him, God gave Jesus all the commands to obey, and he and he obeyed him. So the Father gave Jesus everything, all the instructions on what to do and how to live. That's that's the Father loving Jesus. That's the love that the Father had. He loves me, so he shows me what he's doing. He says. He loves me, so he, 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 he tells me, he gives me instructions on what to do. So just as the Father's loved me, I have also loved you. I've given you instructions on how to obtain life. Okay? Abide in my love. Abide in my instructions. The instructions I've given you on how to achieve eternal life, how to think about it, how, 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 to, how to live your daily life. What, what objectives to have? What should you pursue? How should you pursue it? I've given you all of these instructions. Abide in those, because that's my loving you. That's my love for you. This is what I've done for you. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. You see? In other words, if you keep my instructions that I'm giving you, you're abiding in my love because that's how I love you. I give you these commandments out of love. I'm trying to save you. This is what I'm, I'm trying to help you. So do, it, do what I'm telling you. Trust me, you'll have eternal life. If you don't do it, you won't. This is what he's saying. He's trying to be very, very clear. This is not Christianese. This is real. Just as I have kept my father's commandments and abided his love, he loved me by giving me instructions. I abide in that love by keeping his commandments. You see? You see how that works? Starting to get it. You see, this, this really shouldn't be that hard. It's only wow. hard because the church system has made a mess out of everything. Yep. His commands are love. Our man, his commands are an act of love. And if you don't know his commands, then you're not abiding in his love. Exactly. If you <laughs> blow it off, if you blow if you blow off his commands, you're blowing off his love. Because that's how he loves you. Wow. By showing you the way of salvation. By, by giving Jesus... you the commands that if you do these commands, you're going to make it. If you don't, you won't. He tells you this stuff. He's very open about it, very transparent about the way of salvation. What was the legal term you were talking about in the beginning? The, how it's written or the, the understood? The plain language. Plain language, yeah. Yeah, the plain language. Wow. So this is what, this is what uh, John 15 and that parable means, okay? Understand, it's an act of love for, for him to give you these commandments. Yeah. Understand that it's, it's really telling you to produce, telling you to, to uh, multiply the, the property he gives you. And to produce more is an act of love. That's something so, he's doing for you, for your benefit. So in the parable of the three guys, two of them understood this. 
Yeah. They understood it. And they were pleased as punch to be able to multiply the wealth okay. of the master and then show him the results. They they loved it. They were so excited. Okay. So um, when he says, oh, you're a hard man, the, the wicked slave says a hard man. Well, that's such a worldly perspective. He, he doesn't understand. He doesn't understand Christ at all. He doesn't understand his master at all. But yeah. But this assessment is coming from a slave without eyes to see. The slave clearly did not have the mindset of a slave. Okay. To have the heavenly perspective. Yet the master is not interested in exploiting his servants to enrich himself as the passive aggressive slave implies. He's very passive aggressive in his in his in his speech toward the master. Rather, the master is interested in training productive slaves because those are the only slaves to be allowed in the kingdom he is to receive. Mm. He knows the kingdom will not allow unproductive slaves. They will not be let in. He is going to get a kingdom. The only slaves that will be allowed into his kingdom are those that are productive. He's trying to give them an opportunity and to train them to produce so that they can come in. Hmm. That's what he's doing. And that's what this dumb, wicked, lazy slave lazy. couldn't see or didn't want to see. Hmm. So the, the, the thing in Luke 19, uh, 11 through 7, the parable of the Minas, that's kind of a parallel parable. This is I just wanted to put that in, put this in because it doesn't talk about the kingdom in this parable. Hmm. He just says he's going on a long journey. But in the Minas, parable of the Minas, it says a nobleman went to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself and then return. And he called 10 of his slaves and gave them 10 Minas and said to them, Do business with this until I come back. So the master provided to the wicked slave the money to invest in an amount that would not overwhelm him. He only gave him one talent because he couldn't handle anymore, not because he was being stingy. So he gave him an amount that he could work with after having been trained as to how to invest. The slave merely needed to trust the master's training, devote his life, and efforts to investing the master's money. The slave didn't complain he wasn't trained to invest and didn't know how to invest the money. Mm. In fact, the slave purposely buried the money rather than putting it into a bank, appearing as another lazy, passive-aggressive move to stick it to the man. <laughs> mm. He was basically depriving the master of interest just as a way of going, yeah, here you go. Here's your, here's what you here's what you gave me, master. He clearly did not love the master. He he you know and and this is this is what I believe. I believe many today would agree with the assessment of the wicked slave if they knew Jesus required full time devotion to his agenda. If they understood Jesus to require a full time devotion to his agenda, they would think Jesus is a hard man too. Mm. I think a lot of people that call themselves Christian would say that Jesus is a hard man if if they mm. if they were convinced that Jesus required full-time devotion to his agenda. They would think that's impossible, that's unrealistic. That's you know that that's too much yeah, to yeah. ask. Yeah. They would say that. Yep. Yeah. They would agree with the wicked man. Mm. They would totally agree with him. But instead, thus they blind themselves to this expectation of Christ. At least the wicked man admitted that, that Christ expected that, but they blind themselves to this expected expectation of Christ so they don't harbor resentment toward him. As a result, they follow a different Christ and yep. accept a different gospel. They do not have a sincere and pure devotion to the true Christ, mm -hmm. as Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians 11, 3 through 4, when he says, but I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, 
your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaim, or if he received, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel Hello. from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. Yep. So there's a group preaching a different Jesus, uh, proclaiming a different spirit. And 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 offering a different gospel, and they seem to be they don't seem to be outraged. And 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 Paul's saying, "How do you how are you so tolerant with all this false teaching and these false apostles? How can you tolerate this?" That's what he's saying, and and that's what I think today. If it, if people under really understood who Christ was. And what he expected out of you, they would call him a hard man. They would call him harsh. That's what that's what that means. You're harsh. You're you're a little unreasonable. So he does call him wicked and lazy. He's it's it, which wicked and lazy is the opposite of good and faithful. Wicked resented, uh, which means they resented the demands of his duties as slave of the master. He didn't have eyes to see. He's lazy. He did not want to devote the time and energy required to produce a safe return on the master's money. Instead, he presumably used his time to indulge himself with comforts and leisure time. Yeah. That's, that's what he did with his time. He made, he made life uh, on the here and now much more comfortable and much more luxurious for himself. The wicked slave did not, but, but notice the wicked slave did not renounce his position as slave of his master. He still called him master in verse 24. Thus, for the entire time the master was gone, the wicked slave appears to have identified himself as a slave to the master. Accordingly, he lived in a manner that brought shame to the master, defaming his name, deserving to be cast in the outer darkness where there is, wait, I'm sorry, this wicked slave lived. lived as a classic hypocrite, mm. deserving to be cast in the outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the same thing as Revelations 3, 15 through 19, the message to Laodicea. He says, I know your deeds that you are neither cold nor hot. You don't, you don't say hateful things about me. You don't renounce me as, as a fraud. You don't do those kind of things. You're not cold. But you're not hot either. You're not, you're not zealous. You're not all in. You're not a slave. You're lukewarm. You are lukewarm and neither hot or cold. I will vomit you out of my mouth. It's like the, he wishes you were hot or cold. Because if you're cold, you're not defaming him. You're not bringing his name down. So because you're, 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 um, you're separating yourself from Christ. And that's fine. You want to be an enemy of Christ, he can handle that. If you want to be a slave of Christ and, and behave like a slave of Christ, he loves that. But to be lukewarm, you're a hypocrite. You're defaming him. You're dragging his name through the mud. You're giving everyone a wrong impression of who he is. Okay? That he hates. He wants to vomit you out of your mouth, out of his mouth. Because you say, I am rich and become wealthy and have need of nothing. They think that because they're wealthy and, and they don't, they're, 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 all their needs are met, they think that that's God blessing them and approving of their behavior. And he's saying, no, you got that all wrong. But you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you become rich, white garments so that you may be clothed yourself and the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed and I salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. What's the price? He's, this, he's saying, buy it for me. What do they have to 
purchase these things? How do they purchase these things from Jesus? Through obedience and bearing fruit? Yeah, through losing your life. Your life. Lose your life and find, for my sake, lose your life for my sake, pick up your cross and follow me. That's the purchase price. And then you get to receive these things. That's what you need to do. So if we're praying for eyes to see, um, we've been given the, the direction on how to how to get these clear eyes. Where yes. to buy it. Yeah. We've been given, we know where the store is now. And then he says, those who is. those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. You're rich and you're wealthy and you need of nothing. You know why? I'm not, I'm not disciplining you. I'm not reproving you. Why? You don't abide in my love. You're not no. abiding in my love. I instructed you what to do. And you're not doing it. So you're 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 like you're you're drying up. You're a branch that's been taken away and you're drying up right now. You're not getting so, pruned. Therefore, be zealous, be hot, and repent. And the repent is is uh, Deuteronomy 30, return to the Lord your God and obey him. Right, that's with the, all your heart and soul. That's part of the repentance. Give up your life. Pick up your cross. That's that's what it is. Dang. So this this... And everyone is is basically lukewarm today. This is the, this is how wicked the generation yep. is. Yep. And and the only people that supposedly are losing their life are get they're getting paid for it. <laughs> uh, because that is their life, you know. Um, let me just I I I have just a couple of quick things to say, and then we're done. Um, how long have we been going so far? How long have we been recording? About an hour, 25. Okay, so I should be done in 10 minutes or less. In Luke 17, 7 through 10, just to, just to be clear, what I'm saying to you is not, I'm not making this up, but which of you having a slave plowing or tending sheep will say to him when he has come in from the field, come immediately and sit down to eat? But will he not say to him, prepare something for me to eat, properly clothe yourself and serve me while I eat and drink, and afterward you may eat and drink. He does not thank the slave because he did the things which were commanded, does he? So mm -hmm. you too, when you do all the things which are commanded, which are commanded you, say we are unworthy slaves, we have done only that which we have ought to have done. This is coming out, of, right straight out of the mouth of Jesus. He's not hiding it. He's not hiding it. You're a slave and, and you commit your entire life, devote your entire life to his agenda. And if you don't, you're not worthy. And, and what's going to stop you? First John 2, 15 through 17, do not love the world nor the things in the world. Anyone loves the world, the love of the father is not in him. Oopsie. You don't know the Father if you love the world because you're loving the temporary. You're not loving the, the, the eternal. You're not loving the true. Eternal perspective. And you can't do both. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away and also its lusts. And guess who will pass away with the world? Those that love the world, That's they'll fair. pass away along with the world. Mm -hmm. But the one who does the will of, of God lives forever. That's it for today. That's some uh, fire and brimstone level stuff there. Yeah. But it's, yeah, it's real. Yeah, but you know, it shouldn't, it shouldn't sound like fire and brimstone. It only I'm sounds saying, like fire and brimstone because of the lies that we've been told all our lives. Yeah, that he's a hard man. This is all basic stuff. Good analogy. Yeah. This is just but, basic stuff. Yeah. Mark, the takeaway, yeah. if we're really following 
God, Christ and his commandments, dying to self, all the, everything required, it shouldn't even be a hard task. No, it shouldn't. It should be. That's just what you do. That's what you do. Is that where my yoke is easy and my burden is light? Yes, because right? you love those, those that come to me. Yeah. Because it becomes easy because your heart gets circumcised and you love God with all your heart and soul. And you yeah. don't mind doing things for those you love. Yeah, I think Paul got it. He, he understood that. Oh, he but, understood it. Yeah. He yeah. lived it. Yeah. Yeah. And it was okay. fine for him. Yeah. We're, we're, we're going to check out. Okay. So All let right. me stop the recording. The old right. folks have to get to bed. <laughs> All right. All right. See I you, Ron it. and Darlene. All right. Starting the recording now.